uh, 708. We're going to call the meeting to order. Tonight is Monday, September 17th, and we just met as a board um, pre meeting talking about ESSA. We're going to have our spotlight tonight, um, the approval of the agenda. Tonight, the agenda includes the superintendent's report. Our discussion items are the fall athletic update, the school start update, the 2018 ESSA update. Policy development, first readings, policies, 410 family medical leave and 413 harassment and violence annual review. Policy development, second readings of policies, 510 school activities, 514 bullying prohibition and 515 protection and privacy of pupil records. Then our action agenda is to approve the second readings of policies 510, school activities, 514, bullying prohibition, and 515, protection and privacy of pupil records. We'll have communications and transmittals and then adjourn. Do we have a motion to approve this agenda? Moved, Moved by Jim Benneke. Is there a second? Second by Ann Casey. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? That carries 7 0. And now we will turn it over to our superintendent, Aston Osai, for our spotlight. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Waters, members of the board. Um, we have a core value in St. Louis Park that states everyone has the capacity and responsibility to contribute to the well being of others. And this evening, for our spotlight, I would like to acknowledge local organizations that have contributed school supplies to St. Louis Park Public Schools. This year, similar to past years, there were several local businesses and individuals that donated school supplies to our schools. I would like to thank everyone who has made a contribution to equip our students with supplies for learning. We are grateful for the very generous donations from SharePoint Credit Union, Homeowners Financial, and all of their partners. And I'll just take a second to list all of their partners. Burnett Title, Menards Costco, All American Title, Arc MI Company, Genworth, American Family, State Farm Insurance, Executive Financial, Target, hy V, Cub, Minnesota Orthopedics, and CBRE. Um, I would also like to thank and um, Derek Reiser from the St. Louis Park Emergency Program is here this evening, and I would like to thank um, him and his organization for their contribution to our students. Prior to um, calling up Derek, uh, we have certificates this evening for several of the local organizations that have contributed to our students in our school community. Krauss Anderson, um, excuse me, Krauss Anderson Construction, SharePoint Credit Union, um, Home Owners Financial Group and their partners who are listed um, a second ago. Um, and at this time, if you all would join me in welcoming Derek Reiser, the Executive Director of the St. Louis Park Emergency Program. I'll just speak for one minute, uh, and I just want to acknowledge um, the uh, partners that STEP has to facilitate uh, our program to equip St. Louis Park students uh, with uh, school supplies and with backpacks, and they're too numerous to, um, to name right now, except to our, our volunteer coordinator, Camille Schroeder, uh, who uh, has made this happen for the last 10 years and spends endless hours into it in St. George's Episcopal Church uh, that has hosted this, uh, this program. Um, just give you a number. Um, this year, uh, STEP uh, helped provide 414 St. Louis Park public school students with school supplies uh, and 469 St. Louis Park students with uh, backpacks. And so we really value our students and young people and want them to start the year equipped to learn and are excited by this is just being one of the many ways we uh, partner with the schools for a stronger community. So thank you for the acknowledgement and thank you for the partnership. And, if, and in closing, and I, I'll turn it over to the board here in, in a second if they would like to say anything, but Derek, I just want to thank you again the continued partnership of STEP and the school district has been phenomenal, and I'm looking forward to all of our collaboration moving forward. So thank you. I talk to Derek all the time. Uh, <laughs> I, um, and he puts up with me. No, I'm on the, uh, I'm on the STEP board, and, and it's, um, it's been uh, phenomenal having uh, Derek leading up the, the organization. He's done a, uh, a great job and 
Camille, as usual, uh, talking Ticonderoga pencils year in and year out. This, it really had, it runs a, a tight ship, and you can see how organized it is up in this, this picture. So thanks to Derek, Camille, and, and all the, the volunteers and people who who've donated to this. Thank you very much. We really appreciate all the work that you do on behalf of our students and families. Next up on our agenda is our superintendent's report. And Chair Waters, members of the board, if, it, if it's okay, I would like to do my report from the podium this evening. All right. I figured since I was up here, I might as well just stay. This evening for my superintendent's report, I would like to share some informational items connected to our strategic priorities. The middle school facilities improvement took another step forward last week as the district hosted a neighborhood meeting on September 13th as part of the conditional use permit process required by the city of St. Louis Park. This week, Thursday, September 20th, we will have an opportunity to host a similar community meeting as a part of the CUP process um, re related to the high school. Eight St. Louis Park High School seniors have recently been recognized by the National Merit Scholarship Program as either semifinalists or commended scholars for 2019. As you're aware, National Merit semifinalists are selected based on scores from the PSAT and are now eligible to compete for scholarships worth more than $31 million that will be awarded in the spring of 2019. And annually, we take time in, in our first meeting in November to acknowledge these students and their families and um, the, the teachers that have had an impact on them here in the St. Louis Park Public School District. And lastly, um, but not least, as you all are aware, um, this week is homecoming week. Right now, the coronation is occurring downstairs in the gymnasium, and it's a spirit-filled, energy-filled time here in St. Louis Park Public Schools. There are events all week long um, with the coronation this evening, uh, movie night tomorrow, uh, Potter Puff football game on Wednesday, badminton tournament on Thursday, and Pep Fest on Friday. Um, concluding on Pep Fest on Friday with the um, parade on Friday as well at 530 with the homecoming dance concluding on Saturday. So I encourage you all and everyone else in the community to come out and partake in this wonderful festivity that brings our community together. And that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you so much. And next we're going to hear from Director of Athletics, Andy Ewald. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me tonight. I'm extremely excited to talk about our captain's leadership program that we started a year ago. Um, spring of 2017, I got a phone call from a new resident in St. Louis Park, a gentleman named Kevin King, who's here today in the audience. Um, he just asked, he said, I'm new to the, to the community. Could I have five minutes of your time? I'd love to sit down and just talk about what, what the community is about, what the school district's about, and how he could get involved. Um, we sat down and talked. His background is in leadership training. He has been a professor at University of Michigan. He's worked for multiple NFL franchises doing leadership work. He currently um, does leadership training with a hospital in Wisconsin and a school district in Wisconsin. And I just kind of talked with him about who we are, what St. Louis Park is about, and really tried to figure out a way with him volunteering and offering up his services, how we as a district could take advantage of those. Um, I look at things and think, we've got a great athletic trainer through TRIA. We've got a wonderful strength coach. We have outstanding head coaches that are great mentors and great coaches for our kids. And if this was a way to enhance their experience as student athletes for the here and now, but even bigger than that, for when they move on, when they're college students, when they're employees, when they're employers, when they're spouses, um, that to me is what the investment really was. So last fall, we started meeting with our fall 
head coaches and the captains. We spent probably 45 minutes with each one of those groups individually talking about what their program is about, their culture, what the captains saw, um, what the coaches saw, whose vision was it, was it a shared vision or was it from one group or from the other. And that led into us starting to do in-season sessions with all our captains, um, with each group, with the fall, then with the winter, then with the spring, we've started doing eight sessions in season. Uh, we meet Thursday mornings from 7.30 to 8.30 downstairs. Um, as we first started brainstorming this and as I talked with kids and coaches about it, I really wanted to be respectful with the kids, knowing how busy they are and not wanting them to get pulled in multiple different ways. So we really wanted to stay away from trying to do anything during the school day. We really wanted to stay away from trying to do anything on the weekends because they need their time to be kids. Um, after schools, because of practices and contests, were out. And so with the high school having a later start on Tuesday, Thursdays, we just felt like that was the most appropriate time to do it. Um, I'm at every session. Kevin's facilitating. I'm there. Um, and they work out really well. It's the first half hour of each session is content. And it's, it's not fluff stuff. It's as if they're in a college level class and they're getting content on servant leadership, on culture, on what expectations they have, what problems they're coming up, that they're facing each day or each week with their program. And then the last half hour really is them interacting and dialoguing with each other. And one of the things I really appreciate about what we do is we have them get up in front of the rest of the group and they present to each other. Um, just again to try to, to work on and reinforce those positive skills of public speaking because it's, it's a skill that a lot of them said that this is something I want to get better at. So we're putting them in the situation where they're doing that. Um, it's, it's been fun and interesting to see because at the morning sessions you don't have girls soccer sitting here as a group, boys soccer sitting here, girls swimming sitting there. The groups are mixed up intentionally, so they're there to help each other. Um, we do a lot of work with them outside of those sessions with their own groups, that in those sessions, we really want them to hear other voices and to be hearing other people's experiences and trying to help each other. Um, let's see. And as I'm going, if there's questions, please stop me and we'll go to the questions. So what we started doing year two, which is this year, is we, we met last year with our head coaches. We had about a four hour meeting last winter and what we heard loud and clear from them was they loved what we were doing, but they wished there was a way that going into the season, their student athletes, their captains, their leaders could get a baseline of what we're trying to accomplish with them. And from that grew um, to this year, well, last spring we started it with this year's fall captains and in three weeks we're going to be starting it with this year's winter captains a six week session where it's really kind of giving them the fundamentals and the groundwork so then that way once we get into their season it can be more about what's going on with the here and there and not as much trying to get them to understand what oops sorry what their culture is what the culture of their program is what's their standards um, what type of leaders are they? Are they servant leaders? And what type of servant leaders are they? So a lot of that is getting covered in the six weeks. So then when we get into the eight weeks, it can just, I think we can dig in a little bit deeper with them. Another thing that came from the meeting with the coaches was really a strong feeling of wanting to support this even to the point where if somebody was elected to be a captain, the expectation was that them and their parent guardian agreed that they would be at these 14 sessions, that there's a lot they get from being captains and that we just felt strongly enough. So, you know, so far everybody's been on board with that from the kids to the parents to the coaches. Um, I think it's just, it's made, it's held everybody a little bit more accountable with that, which has been a good thing. Um, so I'm excited with where we're at year two with it. I, I strongly feel like besides the, the shift and the change that we made you know, probably six years ago in our strength and conditioning program and the direction that that is now and where that was going, this is probably the single, second single biggest initiative 
I feel like as a department, we've implemented to really try to enhance the experience for our student athletes. Again, for the here and now, there's a benefit for it with our programs, but big picture for them, you know, walking out of here that at a minimum, they're gonna have 14 hours of really intense, highly thought out, well-planned leadership training that they're getting from us. Um, so the, the, the preseason sessions we're gonna be doing on Tuesday morning. So, you know, starting in, starting in three weeks, Tuesday mornings and Thursday mornings, we'll be down in B135 at 7.30. You're more than welcome to come by and visit. We have lots of head coaches that have stopped down. Um, Aston has stopped down to a session. Um, we've had plenty of media coverage about it. I think that's just because it's what we're doing is pretty unique and not happening anywhere else. Um, I think the, the combined support from our captains, our head coaches, the athletic office, the administration here, it's pretty unique. I know there's other schools in the area that are trying to pick up and do some things like it, but I think what's made this successful for you know, the year plus has been that collectively everybody's really in support of it happening, that it's not just the head coach saying this is something we want or the kids, that it's collectively everybody is really being proactive and, and supporting this, which has been nice. Uh, so we've been on WCCO. Minnesota Prep Spotlight has done a, a video feature on us. Sarah and Matt did a wonderful, wonderful article on it that has been used here in the district, has been part of you know, Lisa's community ed brochure, and then it's also been picked up with some other places. So that was very much appreciated. Um, the other thing that I think has been fun for the kids is we brought guest speakers in. We've had Suze Romer from Best Buy. She's an exec in their human resources. She's come twice to talk with the kids. Um, we've had Sindra, she's a professor at Mankato, who's also a consultant for the Vikings. Um, Sarah Flotten has come in from Breck and really talked about how the neuro, the neuro aspect of leadership, and I th we're gonna have her back. It's been really, that was really interesting, I think, for the kids, it was interesting for me. So I think it's been very nice for them that it's not just Kevin or Andy talking and leading things that you know, probably twice, twice a season we're bringing guest speakers in um, just to lighten it up and freshen it up and have it be different voices. Um, so what's important to me is, go ahead, Ken. I'm sure you're gonna get into it a little later on the experiences and I'd like to hear some of that, but um, I'm wondering, typically a captain is a senior or a junior, right? Um, I'm wondering if the program could extend to those future leaders so that they can have this basis before they become the leader. I know so, you're doing the six weeks before, yep. but um, just kind of thought. Yep, so again, with it just being a year plus, it's in its infancy now. You know, one of the things that when Kevin and I first met and as we've been processing this whole thing as, as we're on this journey is, there's a lot more I want to do, but I'm being, I'm being really intentional in making sure that what we're doing is baby steps, so it's got staying power and it lasts, and not biting off more than we can do now and then it may be lasting for a year and then that part of it kind of slides back. I wanna make sure it's got staying power and that and we get grounded with it before we keep adding more. That's why it was intentional that year one was just the, the 24 or the eight per season in season sessions and then moving into year two was the next step of having the pre sessions. One of the things, but to your point about, you know, reaching down to other kids is our expectation and Kaya can talk more about this when she gets up here if she chooses to, is what we're doing in those sessions, they, it just can't live with them. You know, the expectation for us is if there's 70 kids out on the cross country team that it's not just her and the other four captains of the cross country team where it lives with, their job is to bring it back and make sure that that 70th kid understands what their core values are, what their standards are. Um, and that it's living that way through everybody. And we've, we've really encouraged and pushed our coaches to make sure that they're creating space weekly for their captains and for their kids to have these conversations. Yep. 
if I can jump in there to say that I know that you are the head of athletics in the school, but as the program is growing, I can see how useful this could be to the leaders throughout the school, yep. in the fine arts program, and through our other clubs. I would love to see it could grow. Thank you so much, Mr. King, for bringing this program to our school. Um, I just, it, it could be an amazing benefit to kids outside of the athletic realm who are non-athlete leaders. Yep. I agree with you, and, and that's a step that could happen down the road. You know, it's what's important and even, so in the spring we have 10 sports, in the fall we have seven, in the winter we have seven. Trying to get, you know, anywhere from 19 to 26 kids to commit to being there because the one thing about the work we're doing with them is it's not happening in silos. So if I'm there week one and then not there week two, when week three rolls around, I'm behind. Um, so it really is, it's, it's, it's not been a challenge, but I think that's been, you know, for it to keep working, to your point, if we're going to bring and win and if we bring more kids in, it's just got to be a thing where they can sustain being there to get the benefit of it. Otherwise, it's, you're just kind of doing it for the sake of doing it. Any other questions now before I have the people that really matter, their voices heard? I just want to say I appreciate what you just said there on the um, taking those steps so that you can grow the project or the program as opposed to just shove it all in there and then everybody gets tired. For sure, because I, I mean I've got vision for days of what I'd like to see happen, but it's I've got to slow myself down and make sure I want it to be sustained. I want it to be here you know, four years, five years, six years from now and see where it's grown to then and not try to bite it all off now. So, like I said, the voices that are most important to me are, you know, one, our head coaches and, and their perspective on this and then even more important than that is our student athletes and two of the three that had committed to being here ended up having scheduling problems, but we do have Kaya here with us. But I'll, I'll ask Arsenio Richardson, who works at our middle school, coaches football and basketball here. He's a park alum. His wife teaches over at Aquila. He's a park resident. Um, just for his perspective on it and anything he wants to share. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for having me. Um, Andy kind of told you I am. Um, my main perspective or what I um, kind of took was um, at first meeting Kevin, he would come to um, football practices, and since I'm not the head football coach, I, I didn't know who he was. So um, he would show up, and, you know, he would converse with Ben. I just kind of thought maybe he was a college scout or um, maybe somebody from the paper. Um, so he would come, and he would check out practices. So um, moving forward into the winter season, um, I got to know that he, you know, he was doing the leadership thing, and one thing that just jumped onto my mind was it's easy for um, somebody that's going to work with athletes to just come, come to a game and come see them compete in the game. But um, the, all the leadership stuff he was doing uh, with our current football team last year with, with those captains resonated, and it showed them that it, it wasn't just about um, him watching them play the games or him. he genuinely cared. He came to practices. He wanted to kind of see – how we were translating some of the stuff that they were doing in the leadership aspect to practice and to games. And I just think with all the groups that he was working with and, you know, when, when I seen his resume and I just was like, you know, he's, he's so professional and he's dealing with, you know, these high school kids. I just thought like it was amazing. And some of the conversations I had got back from the football guys was it, it's going to help them when they're filling out their applications for college or a couple of them had, a little, they were a little nervous about getting, going to interviews for jobs, and that that was huge. And then once the winter rolled around, um, I, I coached the, the girls' basketball team, and the girls aren't as boisterous as the boys were, so they were a little hesitant, a little nervous, really, really didn't take to it like they should at first. And once they started going, it was girls that really wouldn't say much that came out of their shells still were a little tentative but I seen a little different side I seen when when coaches would call or when they would when they would ask some of the coaches it was it was a little more attentiveness and things like that so just just that brief um eight weeks that they had I, I felt like it was changing and um you know if, if we're if we're raising leaders 
Um, sometimes I feel like they, they need that extra coaching and professional on, you know, what a leader is. A lot of times we, you know, with athletics, you know, you just typically nominate the best athletes to be the captains. When all actuality sometimes is not that. So I think that um, working with, with the captains and working with kids that, um, like you said, that aren't just in athletics, but just leaders of the school, you know, I think that would be huge. But all the work that Kevin has put in from coming to practices, um, getting to know the coaches, getting to know the kids, and remembering their names. I mean, uh, you it's just, it's just been phenomenal in the year and a half that, you know, I've seen it. So I just think it continues to grow. And like anything, you know, I, I hear kids that, you know, don't want to get up and things like that. But then once they're there, they're they're awesome. And like Andy said, they're they're intermingling. And so some that might be a problem at swimming might be the same problem at football. And they, they would never converse unless they're at this leadership thing. So I just think that it's super awesome. I think um, one more thing we had a, we had a gentleman that he, he was a captain for all three seasons. And my conversations with him was, you know, does it get boring? And he's like, no, it's something different every time. He said, from the fall, football, we had different problems. Hockey, we had different problems. Baseball, different problems. And he was just like, it was something, I took something away. So, you know, I, I, I threw the, the bone out there to see if it was going to be a negative response. And this gentleman was like, I went to all three, all three seasons. And he was like, I took something back every time. And for that sake, you know, he, he said he grew tremendously. So I just think that, you know, the work that you're doing, Kevin, is just just awesome. Um, you've been great. The kids identify you as a leader in our community, and it's just super awesome. So I'll turn it over to Kaya. Um, she'll give you the athlete perspective, but um, I just want to continue to thank you and thank you, Andy, for, you know, going out on a limb. This is not something that, you know, when you think about athletics, you think, like, that should be on the forefront is leadership. So you take an initiative and being a trailblazer and taking that leadership thing is um, super awesome. So thank you for having me. All right. Hi, um, I'm Kaya Myers, and I am a junior here at St. Louis Park, and I am a fall captain for cross country. And um, so I've completed the preseason training for that and two of the, like, during the season trainings. Um, something that has really stood out to me, sort of an example of how we have applied some of the, or we as the cross country team, have applied some of the things that we have learned in the leadership training to our team, was in the creation of our core values. Um, something that Kevin really strives to, um, like, stress um, is to create it be very purposeful in what we are doing. And so we were able to, as captains, sit down and create core values for our team. So we, um, you, we created them with an acronym, CARE, because we want to be like a family and um, just be really supportive of each other. So the C is for communication, the A is for attitude, the R is for responsibility, and the E is for effort. And um, we also sat down with the whole team and had them kind of put in their voices as well and they got to sort of vote and decide and like make sure that we were all on the same page in wanting to follow these values. Um, and to implement them, we did a few um, activities. So we had like for one week, for example, we ha assigned a letter to each of the days and um, people on the team focused on that core value for the day. For, so for example, the C for communication was on a Monday and um, they just focused on communicating and we gave a prize to the people that kind of stood out the most to us. And that got everybody really excited about them and people have been very interested in sort of creating this closer family dynamic and following the values and not just focusing completely on just cross country as a sport but also focusing on getting our team closer together. And um, another thing that I've really enjoyed from this training is sort of the opportunity to be able to speak with the other captains from other sports because it has helped us to sort of confront problems that we see um, in b different sports. So for example, we as the cross country team, we have athletes 
from seventh grade to 12th grade on our team and it's kind of difficult sometimes to get them to bond all together and the swim team was also struggling with that and so we sat down and brainstormed some ideas on things like team bonding that we could do and other things like that so that was another helpful thing that we um, did in just the preseason when we were sort of thinking about problems or like foreseeing problems and um, it was really really helpful and yeah I'm really excited to continue this training and I'm also going to be a track captain so I'm excited to sort of apply these same things that I'm learning to that team and also allow that one to grow stronger. I have a question for Arsenio. So um, I wasn't clear, do you got you also attend the courses or you just stop in every once in a while? Well, I, my, my school, unlike all the other schools, start at um, 7.15. So I, I haven't actually, we have like a preseason one and then we have one with all the coaches. So I personally have not attended any of the Thursday sessions. Um, I'm currently working that out with uh, my, my principal at my, my middle school. I think you answered the question that I was really trying to get to, and that is, do the coaches also go through some of this training? Yes. So that's, yes. that's good. Well, I just want to thank all of you for coming down. I'm, thank you so much for volunteering, Mr. King. I'm just really excited. I may have to show up at 7.30, and that would be a push for me. <laughs> but this is a great program, Andy, and I'm really excited for our students and that you've got it going. And it really um, sort of fits our mission statement in many ways, but, but one of those is prepare all students to contribute to society, mm -hmm. and the other is um, challenge all learners to meet high standards. And it sounds to me like that's a part of what this program is about. And Arsenio, I cheered you on the football team and on the field. And, and it's just exciting for me to see you here and what you're contrib contributing to us as one of our alums. So thanks. I just, oh, like Nancy, I want to say thank you, Kaya. I saw you guys out running in the rain today, and I was very impressed. <laughs> well done. And I just want to know if anyone, what I'm kind of interested in is how um, this trickles down to your athletes. So, I, Andy, you kind of mentioned like the, the 70th person, right? So, did, do any one of you three have, a, have like a little story or a tidbit of an example where it kind of trickled down to a team, made some kind of change or improvement in the team based on the, something that the, the leaders had learned? Um, so, for example, when I was talking about that week or at the beginning of the season when we focused on our core values just to like implement them it was like the first week of the season and just so that everybody kind of was on the same page um, one of our seventh graders everybody was complaining about doing core which we after we run we like do core exercises push-ups and like crunches and things like that and people were complaining because the grass is wet and it was actually after a rainy day like a while ago <laughs> and one of the seventh graders who um, usually I've noticed has been very quiet and just sort of more in his shell um, he stepped up and was like because it was attitude day and he was like guys no we need to have positive attitudes like we need to um, be like we need to be on our A game and just like do this because it will benefit us and help us to get stronger. And so that was an example of how I noticed like a younger seventh grader who was usually more shy sort of saw the core values that he had agreed to and stepped up and it was really cool. And so he actually got the prize for that day because he really stood out to us. So yeah. <laughs> so and to that point though, I, I think what I've seen is kind of not challenges, but the the biggest areas of work for our captains to work on is one to realize how intentional they have to be with this and it's practicing it all the time and it's not just practicing being a leader you know from 3:30 to 5:30 after school you know it's during the school day it's at home that it's not something you can really turn on and off so that intentionality with it and then two really again back to the point of it can't just live with them that's a hard thing to do so while you're pra really trying to focus and practice on yourself of being intentional with this of making sure you're trying to bring that whole group along with you that's that's part of the journey and part of what we're trying to that's going to take time yeah 
Andy, Kevin, Arsenio, Kaya, thank you so much. This was a great update. We appreciate all the work and look forward to hearing uh, more results as you continue on. I do want to do a quick pause. I forgot to do the picture with the spotlight with Derek and Aston, so we're going to do that and then move on to the update message. Thank you so much. Thank appreciate you for it. having us. So next on our agenda is the, the start of the school update with Superintendent Aston Osai. All right, Chair Waters, members of the board. This evening I want to just share several items that I'm excited about as it relates to the start of the school year. And the first item is that summer construction um, was completed on time, and I should probably also add on budget, all right? So on time, on budget, but we, we were absolutely, round of applause for that. But as you all know, we had $6.8 million worth of construction projects this summer, including everything from cooling projects, deferred maintenance, um, mock classroom development, security, electrical, mechanical, um, and, and relocating our district office at the same time. So I really would like to thank our staff and Krauss Anderson for everything they did to um, make sure that the projects went smoothly. And um, in the pictures that you'll see there, I, I really want to highlight our, our staff, particularly our custodial staff. They did a tremendous amount of work over the summer to make sure that buildings were ready for staff to return in August. A couple of weeks ago, we welcomed back students and families with several different back-to-school events. At each of our sites, you know, it was great to make it to those events and just see the excitement of our student staff and families to be back in our buildings. And it was um, a little extra exciting to see our students who were experiencing some of their new classroom spaces and just the joy that that brought not only to them, but um, surprisingly, I, I think our staff was more excited than the kids even were about the, some of the new spaces that have come out of the, the bond referendum. Annually, um, as we approach the beginning of the school year, we take some time to really reflect on our current reality as it relates to our data. Um, and on August 16th, we held our annual data retreat where all sites come from across the district to really review the previous year's data. And this allows us to really drill down what were some of the challenges that we faced looking at our goals and looking at our action items and determining what the most next appropriate action is to take. Um, and this evening, actually the next presentation, Prachi and I will provide an overview of the Every Student Succeeds Act and an overview of our achievement on state and local goals. One of my favorite days of the year is our back to school kickoff where we, as an entire staff, really have an opportunity to deepen our understanding of our, our mission, our strategic plan. And I, I thank those of you that were able to make it for coming out that day. It really energizes our staff to have you all there and to um, have an opportunity to interact and, and learn with them. My, well, actually, I yeah, take that back. Did I say that was my favorite part of it, my favorite day? This is actually my, my favorite day. I'm, I, like many of our students and staff, have a, a, a difficult time sleeping the night before. And um, this year, there was no exception. And although we had rain, day one pr proved to be a high energy and most importantly, a day of celebration for our students returning to school. And I'm, I'm really thankful for all of the community members that came out to support our students on that day. I'm thankful to each of you that were able to participate. Um, you know, it, St. Louis Park is truly a special place. You know, I, it's not everywhere where you have city and state elected officials that, that come out to welcome and greet students, where you have leaders from our local business community, you have retired school staff, you have people from the neighborhoods coming out, and really all to just inspire and prepare our students well for the, for the start of the school year. So I'm extremely grateful for that, and um, this by far is my favorite day of the year. Um, and which leads us to just the, the learning and fun that we really try to create in our schools here in St. Louis Park. And I've, I've been impressed. I've spent a lot of time in classrooms over the past couple of weeks. And um, in, in each classroom, in each school I've been in, I've been pleased by um, the, the positive start, the energy that I'm seeing. And I, I've noticed that in every one of our site, site staff have really been intentional about building community and developing a common understanding around agreements, how we're going to interact and treat one another. Um, I've, I've also 
been pleased by some of the lessons that I've been able to participate in and the manner in which students' voices are elevated and that the collaboration amongst students. And, you know, either it be, you know, a kindergarten classroom or an 11th grade U.S. history class that I've been in, I've noted, noticed an excitement of learning um, from, our, from our students. And I, I'm, I'm excited about that and looking to continue that as we move throughout the, the, the course of this school year. And that concludes my um, school start presentation. Are there any questions that you have for me? Um, just have some feedback on Susan Lindgren construction. Um, so it was raining on the first day. I asked my kids how school went, <laughs> and my son said, well, it was great to play in the gym and not be drenched uh, with sweat yeah. at the end of the day. So the AC is working really nice. <laughs> I can feel it when I go in and drop yeah. off at yeah. kids' place. It's been uh, refreshing. Yeah. So. Appreciate that. And as a new kindergarten parent myself, as Susan Lindgren, and uh, with a five-year-old who plays really hard, that, that air condition has made a difference. So thank you for sharing that. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. Well, I live across the street from a retired teacher, <laughs> and her empathy on the first day of school was, oh, those poor teachers, indoor <laughs> kindergarten on the first yeah. day of school. Uh -huh. So I'm glad it worked out. Yes, absolutely. Yep, go ahead. Uh, to move away from the excitement of day one for a second, Aspen, I'm hoping that you can talk just a little bit about the um, content that we received on that back to school day for the professional yeah. development around gender inclusion, just to follow up. Uh, for the community on when we pass a gender inclusion policy and how we worked hard to ensure that there would be professional development for our teachers Absolutely. and staff. If you could just say a little bit more about how we met that um, mm -hmm. goal with who you brought in. Yeah, thank you, um, Mary, um, for sharing that. And as I, you know, as I reflected on this, or as I mentioned this, the day of deepening our, our understanding, August 28th, I didn't go into great detail about all of the different professional development that occurred, but I, I wanna first start off by saying that what we provided staff on that day was directly connected to our mission and our strategic plan. Um, and as you've identified, we made a commitment as each of you took courageous, courageous action in June of last year to pass the gender inclusion policy. And as part of that policy, there's language around professional development. So we were, um, we were blessed to have Joel Baum from Gender Spectrum with us. And he spent um, half the morning with our staff really providing an overview of of gender identity and really just helping us to become more gender literate. Um, and in the afternoon, offered multiple breakout sessions for our staff from a professional development standpoint. Um, I'm, I'm also happy to say that we, we've continued to um, build and refine and develop our procedure in this area, really drilling down around um, the, to meet the needs of students, everything from professional development to facility use to um, how students will have an opportunity to modify, change their name or pronoun if, if need be. So we're excited about hopefully very soon rolling that out. And, um, and the, the piece that um, continues to just warm my heart about our staff in this community is that throughout the feedback that I read, there was so much excitement and support of the work that we're doing in that area. So I, I continue to be inspired by my colleagues here in St. Louis Park, and I'm looking forward to the work that we're gonna do to continue to meet the needs of all learners. So thank you for the question. Any, any other questions? Yeah, I just, um, having had the opportunity to, to attend part mm -hmm. of the um, back to school kickoff and part of the data retreat, I was struck by the enthusiasm not, not surprised by, hmm. but struck by the enthusiasm of our staff and everybody who gathered there and the um, breadth of opportunities that, that the district created for professional development on the back to school day and the many breakout sessions that existed. And I heard from many people that had trouble choosing among them because there were so many good choices and good um, programs for, and correct me if I'm wrong, but all of our staff. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that was a change that you might want thank to talk you. about. Yeah, thank you. You know what, I, I, I should sit down and let you all do this presentation because I'm, <laughs> I'm clearly forgetting all sorts of key points, but um, thank you for that, Nancy. And one of the pieces that we, you know, we were hearing as feedback from our colleagues on these days, particularly this one day a year when we have the opportunity to have all staff together in the afternoon, traditionally our professional development would be geared towards our teaching staff. So one of the things that we wanted to do this year was create a, a more robust um, 
menu of options so that all of our staff members would have access and opportunity to continue to develop themselves professionally. So um, that was exciting and we've gotten a lot of positive feedback um, from that day and we look forward to replicating that model at, at future professional development sessions when we have all staff together. Aston, thank you so thank much you. for that report. And then we're going to head right into the ESSA update with um, Director of Assessment Research, Prachi Mukherjee, and yourself. All right. Chair Waters, members of the board, um, I'm, I'm thankful to have an opportunity this evening to share with our Director of Assessment, Prachi Mukherjee, an overview of the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, and um, Chair Waters, as you mentioned earlier, as we started, we, we sp began our evening together this tonight really talking about some of the data connected to that. And what we hope to do here is provide a much deeper overview of each of the components of ESSA and um, what that means for us here in St. Louis Park. To, to start off with, I, I think it's always important to know where you're going and is to understand where, you, where you've come from. And as you all are aware, and there's been an evolved, there's really been an evolving accountability system in, in this country and starting with the 1965 Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And most recently, and since 1965, has been reauthorized eight times. Most recently, No Child Left Behind in 2001. And I, I, would, I would say um, that a lot of there, there, there has been a lot of frustration um, expressed from educators around these different accountability systems, but as it relates to Every Student Succeed Act and even No Child Left Behind, some of the good pieces that came out of that is that for the first time, um, you know, we had an accountability system that really caused us to examine gaps and determine strategy to close those gaps. And um, that, that piece, you know, I can go to bed at night resting my head on the pillow knowing that we're working towards closing gaps and creating a more equitable environment here in St. Louis Park and in this country for all learners. Um, one of the pieces we also wanted to share, particularly as it relates to Minnesota's ESSA equity commitment and our, our strategic plan, um, as, as Prachi has been going through webinars and trainings around ESSA, one of the pieces that has really stood out to her and to me as she shared the information she's been learning is the commitment to equity from the state of Minnesota. It's, it's, it's much deeper and more intense than it's ever been before um, in, in, in my history or in, in Prachi's history for that matter. And the, the piece that really resonated or excited us, and I would like to commend each of you and all of those that were a part of our strategic planning process and the, the forethought they had to develop a strategic plan that really embodied um, many of these equity commitments that are listed here from the state. Because even as you look at that first bullet, you know, you think about developing students to their fullest potential, you'll see common or similar type language in our mission statement as well. And um, I think the thing that most excites me about um, the Minnesota ESSA equity commitments is the recognition of the historic conditions and barriers that have really led to many of the, the gaps that we're facing here um, in the state of Minnesota. And I, and I, as we talked about this morning at Cabinet, it's much deeper than just recognizing the gaps. It's about implementing strategic action to, to eliminate those and improve outcomes for students. Another shift in, um, that, that's come along with the, the ESSA Every Student Succeed Act is the shift in, in racial demographic categories and, and, and to, in a very uh, short period of time. The main differences here as you think about the previous categories compared to the ca um, current categories is that um, two or more races um, have, have been called out in those categories and eight, uh, Pacific Islanders used to be connected to, um, to Asian students and that has been separated for to have its own category with Native Hawaiian students. So now Asian students have their, their own category. And I'm now going to turn it over to um, Prachi, who's going to take us deeper into the different components of ESSA and um, provide an overview of some of the data. Thank you, Astad. Um, good evening, everyone. So um, to start looking at these components, which are brand new this year, and we are 
learning about how uh, they operate and how they're calculated and what they mean. Uh, so f the first thing you'll notice is that it's components. So the focus is not on one overall super score, but um, certain items have been called out and there's a score associated with each one of those. So the public release of this data happened at the end of August, um, 30th August, and it's you can pull it up, the public can see it under uh, a label, new label called North Star, and this is on MDE's report card website. So the components are academic achievement, academic progress, which is not applicable to our high school because grades nine through 12 um, don't fall in that category, it's only grades three through eight. Um, progress towards English language proficiency, and this applies only to our English learners. Consistent attendance, and then graduation, which for us applies only to our high school. So uh, the first item, academic achievement. This means that all the students who are eligible for testing are going to impact our rate, our academic achievement rate. This is different from proficiency and I'll explain soon how it is different. Um, the criteria are different. So it used to be October 1 and under ESSA, this has shifted now to enrollment December 15th or later. And um, then the student also has to be enrolled during the test accountability window which is a different window. So if I have a student enrolled in the district during that accountability window, I'm expected to test that student. The first window in February applies to access, which only English learners take, and the next window applies to the state tests in reading and math, MCA and MTAS. Um, there should be no significant gap in enrollment for students to be counted as eligible for this um, calculation. and. An absence of 15 consecutive days is considered significant gap in enrollment. Then um, the student should have an average daily membership of at least 50%. Lastly, um, EL and SPED students who have exited their programs will continue to be counted um, towards EL and SPED groups. So that if you think about the rationale, you know, we have SPED students who enter a program and then we make great gains with them and then they exit, but then the SPED group doesn't really get to benefit from the gains that we made with the students. So for up to two years after exiting, their scores can contribute to that group. Um, the other rule is still the same as before, that there should be at least 20 students in a group for them to be part of the district or school average. The only students who would be not a part of the academic achievement calculation are of course students who don't meet these criteria and if they do meet the criteria but have a medical exemption. So then they would be taken out. The next item under um, ESSA components is academic progress and this is a new way of thinking about academic progress. This is based on a student who has two years of MCA data, grades three through eight, and looking at their achievement level. How did it change? So for example, if a student was does not meet standards in year one and year two um, remain does not meet standards, then they generate zero points. If that does not meet standards student becomes partially meet standards, then the student would generate eight points, so on and so forth. So, all the points that are um, obtained by students in a particular school is averaged for the school score. And in the case of the district, it's averaged for the district. The reason 10th grade and 11th grade high school students are not part of this is because there's too much of a gap. There's the last time they take reading is in eighth grade and then the next time they take it is in 10th grade and then it wouldn't be reliable to come up with growth measures. Um, I think that Oh, the other point regarding this is when looking at academic progress points, it is not at all advisable to compare schools. Well, in general, let me back up. In general, the state is saying do not compare SS scores across schools for a number of reasons. For academic progress specifically, do not because how much 
how many points I'm able to generate as a school is dependent on where my students were in year one. And if a, student, if a school already has a lot of proficient students who maybe maintain their proficiency or move from meets to exceeds, they're not going to be able to generate as much points. But that's not a bad thing. So that's one caveat against not comparing schools or districts simply based on academic progress points. Yes. So is this year one, or are they backfilling this data so that we have a progress marker already? This is year one, so 2018 is the first year of identification, and in order to be fair, what they're doing is, um, for academic achievement, they've averaged three years of data. So they recalculated 2016, 17, 18 data using the new criteria on the previous page, so academic achievement is um, averaged over three years. Academic progress is new. The third item is progress towards English language proficiency, and this is really significant because before ESSA, English learners were also held accountable because they received Title III funds. They were held accountable for a number of things, but their results were never part of a school's report. It kind of sat separately in something called uh, AMAO. But now, as part of ESSA, these students' scores and their growth is going to contribute to the school and district scores. So this goes a long way in making sure that these schools are also part of the school community or the district community. So they're going to generate points. And if you think about uh, MAP, typical growth, how every student has a growth item, a growth target based on where he or she starts, it's similar to that. It's also dependent on the grade level in which the student starts because based on their observation, empirical data, is that lower grade levels, the students can become proficient sooner. So usually the schools are going to, uh, students are going to have a timeline of, um, I want to say, two to seven years on an average. And every student is going to generate scores based on how close they get to their target. The target is an overall composite of 3.5. And access test tests students on four domains, speaking, listening, reading, and writing. And so the overall composite has to be four and a half, but the student must also get three and a half in at least three of the four domains. So here's a visual representation. If you look at student A going from year one to year two, let's say year um, two is where the target is. Let's say student doesn't quite make it all the way to the target, but makes it 70% of the way. So the student generates 70 points. In student B's case, the student only makes 30% of the way towards target, so the student generates 30 points. Student C exceeds target, but still makes 100 points. 100 is the maximum, 100% of the target. In the same way, on the flip side, student D decreases, doesn't grow. They don't, uh, they're not penalized for that. Consistent attendance is another new item that's going to generate a score for the school and district. And the idea here is about defining consistent attendance as attending more than 90% of the time. Anything less is considered chronically absent. And there is no goal or target in this case, but the state has an aspirational target of 95% by 2020 with no group below 90%. And then we um, get data to use with each of our schools and look at student groups disaggregated to see if there is an attendance issue with any of our students, if that is contributing to their um, lack of performance, let's say. So one of the things that I heard in the many webinars that I've already attended is that the data that we're being provided is the smoke, it's not the fire. So it's an invitation to dig deeper to figure out what is causing the data, what is beneath the surface or the iceberg analysis that we do with our um, teacher leaders and leadership teams. Graduation rates, so this is going to be applicable only to high schools. So if you think about um, progress, Academic progress, this is where the high school didn't have any score, and therefore they're going to have a score for graduation rates, which is not applicable to the other schools. 
And in the majority of cases, a student's graduation rate is going to count for the high school where the student graduates. And the students are placed into four categories, graduated, dropped out, continuing, and unknown. And unknown really is when the state is not able to locate any data on the student. And you also may remember that we have at least two years of graduation rates that we look at right now is four years and seven years. So four year graduation rates and seven year graduation rates, recognizing that not everybody is going to graduate in four years. So uh, now for a closer look at something that is unique to our district is declining participation in state tests. You may also recall that ESSA requires us to be very um, transparent with our parents and letting them know that they do have the right to opt out their students of state testing or any testing. So based on that, St. Louis Park students, especially at the high school, um, have submitted a lot of requests for opting out of tests. And we have three years of data right here. Um, on the left is St. Louis Park and on the right is Minnesota. So if you want to use a benchmark statewide, um, by student group, you can see, for example, if you look at the last row, we had 96% of our students participating in math, um, state assessments in 2016, and now last year it was down to 90%. And like I said, in the case of the high school, it would be an even sharper decline. And now, also keep in mind what I said about academic achievement and how it's going to be calculated, just because a student doesn't take the test doesn't mean that it's neutral in terms of impact. That student, if the student met all the eligibility criteria of being enrolled December 15th or later, 50% average daily membership, being enrolled during the testing accountability window, not um, have no significant gap in attendance, and not have a medical excuse, then they are going to count. And so the academic achievement rate then is going to be impacted negatively. So here's the impact of declining math participation. On the left is the achievement rate, which takes every student into account in calculating the rate. And on the right is proficiency. It's just based on students who have valid scores. So for all students in 2018, you can see that the rate was 51% when we look at academic achievement. But when we go to proficiency, it's 56%. So Prachi, are you saying that on the achievement side of that, students that opt out reduce the score. Yes. But that opt out factor does not is not considered and has no effect on the proficiency side. Right. Okay. And academic achievement is one of the components under ESSA. No, they're holding us accountable. ESSA requires us to test every student whom we have been educating. Again, to go back to the public accountability of we are responsible as public schools to teach our students the standards. There is also, I'm sorry, yes. And then there's, there's also the numbers that aren't showing up on here that we have no idea what they are, and that is the kids that uh, the parents force them to take the test, but they choose to just fill in the Christmas trees. So it's another one of those over test or um, just, I don't know. It skews the validity, okay? Mm -hmm. it, it just really has an impact on how valid these numbers are, which then in turn, how do we make use of them? And I think what I understood in the hour before, you're really digging deeper into what you said earlier, the analogy, what's below the tip? of the iceberg. Yes, and also know that the state has invested considerable funding, taxpayer dollars, into creating tests, the state tests, which are designed to measure state standards, learning on the state standards. So that is our best test. Um, now, granted that not all students like standardized testing, but it's also our work to make sure that our teachers and community members and students understand the purpose of the test and are not opting out simply because there is an option to opt out. Did you want to add anything, Aston? Um, so looking at the impact of declining 
reading participation, um, it's slightly better than math. We have more of an opt-out in math. Um, you can see that in our district, for all students in 2016, 99% of the students tested, and in 2018, 94% of the students tested. And statewide, you don't see much of a difference when you go over to the right side and see um, the state numbers. So this opt-out phenomenon is really um, isolated to a few districts. Patchy, do we um, collect any data as to exactly why parents are choosing to opt out? Do we ask those questions and um, gather that information? Yes, um, we have, from last year, we have a lot of information. Much of it had to do with um, not wanting the student to have too many tests. And to go back to the over-testing piece, like being a data person, I'm going to tell you that I looked at an EL student in um, fifth grade or eighth grade. So that's the grade level when if you're an EL student, you're going to take the access test, you're going to take reading, you're going to take math and science. It's less than 2% of instructional time. So when we say that it's over testing, I'm only looking at standardized tests, which is MAP, Fast Elementary, um, Fast Bridge Elementary, and then MCAs. So if you're saying over testing, what are we really thinking about and talking about? Because with respect to time, it doesn't look like it's taking up a big chunk of time. And also when I looked at fifth grade, it's uh, testing then three times a year with MAP and FastBridge. So it's the maximum amount of time you can think of a student spending on standardized tests. And also interestingly, we have no opt-out requests for our ACT tests. So the argument that standardized tests, my, my child can't take standardized tests or the student cannot engage with the standardized test that, you know, kind of doesn't hold true. Is this um, consistent across all the grades, uh, the opting out, or is it more at the high school because they're already taking a bunch of IB and AP tests, or, or is it across the board? It's at the high school, and actually as of 2017, we changed the state test schedule so that it would not be in the middle of AP and IB testing. So it happens quite early. And again, the impact of declining reading participation, you can see that for achievement, um, we had 57% last year for all students, and for proficiency, we would have had 60%. So now moving on to the ESSA indicators for our state, our ESSA scorecard, if you will. This is district-wide, and you have St. Louis Park and Minnesota. So Although we are not um, going to benefit from comparing, I've simply given you the state data as a point of reference. Um, and you can see that academic achievement of reading, math, most of those components, um, St. Louis Park is ahead of the state. And again, when it is ahead, we dig deeper into the data and find out which grade levels is it. Is it every student group? These are all averages for all student groups, so it does not tell the full story of um, every student group. Now ESSA has been encouraging us to um, tell the story of our students and our work with our students using data that is meaningful at the local level. And um, so I wanted to share with you, we're going to develop these stories as we, um, Sarah and um, Aston and I and our other members of the cabinet, we're going to um, think about what data do we want to use to tell um, the story of our schools. And for today, what I want to share with you are our student engagement survey results. And this is um, one of the pillars that we have in planning our work is um, students at the center. And you must have heard uh, Superintendent Osai talk again and, and again about the value of elevating student voice, because it's, after all, they are our customers, uh, number one. So when we ask them about wh how engaged do they feel in the classroom, we use a survey, K-12. There are three different surveys, actually. One is for K-2, then another one for 3-5 and 6-12. And the survey is based on um, nationally recognized tripod survey. This was the only survey that was used in um, measures of effective teaching, the Gates study that was done a few years ago. So um, our student engagement survey results, this is for K-2, and it represents about 1,000 um, 
students. And you can see that in you know, each of these five components, which are strongly correlated with student achievement, that um, we have data on which are the concepts on which we're doing pretty well, which are the concepts on which maybe we have room for improvement. And the five concepts are engage, and that's about having a caring, supportive relationship with the student. Illuminate is about um, checking for understanding. Managing is classroom management, redirecting off-task behavior. Um, I'm sorry, engage is about seeking student perspectives and valuing student perspective. And relate is about having caring, supportive relationships. And stretch is about persistence and rigor. So this is the student data that is letting us know what is the student experience like in the classroom. Is this the same survey that was mapped on to core values? Yes. Thank you for that. Um, yes, yeah, so we also use that to look at how do the students experience core values in the classroom. And um, yeah, that's another way that we can use this data that we are already collecting. These are the results from grades three and five. And you can see that um, the scores are pretty high. It's a five point scale. And right now I'm only showing you three of those five points. Two of those five points actually. Yes, always, mostly yes. And then the third bar is a combination of those two. And this is grade six through 12 district-wide data. Again, this represents over 3,000 uh, student voices. And um, this data gives us a standardized way to collect student voice on what does the classroom experience feel like. We are going to be doing that once a year. Any questions? Well, we did have a lot of questions at 6 o'clock, but Nancy? Yeah, we did. I just want to uh, thank you, uh, Prachi, for all the seminars you're attending to learn this new uh, system that we're in year one of. And uh, to just clarify for the home audience that the that the racial and ethnic categories that you talked about earlier are determined by the self-reporting of the students and the family. It's not a determination that the school district makes, but it's self-reported. Is that right? Yes, it's uh, whatever information they provide in the enrollment form. Thank you so much. We really appreciate um, your work in this area. Now, the next item on our agenda is policy development, first readings, policies 410, family medical leave, and 413, harassment and violence annual report. Um, these were last uh, reviewed. Uh, these are annual. Uh, MSB is not offering any new changes to these policies in this current year. Is there anything else we need to discuss on this? Thank you, Chair Waters and the board. In comparing to MSBA, there were no legislative uh, changes. There were no MSBA changes. 410, there were no new changes um, from administration as well. And 413, in the procedures, we made a few corrections at cabinet level and some input from board members. So in front of you, you have a revised procedures that is not up for approval just for your information of the requests that were, were made to the superintendent's office. Mary? Uh, I'm sorry, just one second. I need to put my uh, fingers on the part that I'm talking about in um, policy 410. Um, Superintendent Osai, if you help, can help me remember what I was asking this about, or I was asking you about where that was, where it references that the board is to annually review the superintendent's directives and guidelines. Where, are, where is that? It's in the procedures, Mary. Way at the bottom of the procedures. Bottom of the procedures. So we obviously don't have to approve that, as you mentioned, Cindy, but we do may want to have that language change so that it reflects that the board will not annually review and approve that language, but rather that the superintendent and his administration will do so. Yeah, we, we um, 
we certainly can make that change and that would be more accurate of how the current practice actually occurs. Right. If there are there any other uh, questions we have related to these first readings, these are just the, both of these policies were passed this calendar year previously, so we shouldn't have too much change. Yeah. We're just trying to not. keep up with our annual <laughs> review cycle. So, we, yeah, we, go ahead, Joe. Um, on four thirteen. Um, G. Yes, Listen. those are those are the changes that were brought by forward by administration. Director of Special Services should really read Director of S Student Services because it's referring to students in in paragraph G of procedures. So it it appears twice, and then at the last uh, sentence of that, um, cabinet members decided that. Um, say for instance the complaint was against one of the human rights officers then the option would be for the person that's filing the complaint to go to the other human rights officer or designee or the superintendent to get more options does that help you anticipated the wrong question but i appreciate that that was actually helpful to me i was wondering about the footnote at the end that is there a footnote that's cut off or is that one that is a typo okay. But I do appreciate the other. There was uh, a footnote on the um, MSBA page where they have a lot of, you may, you may, you may do this, and we struck that last time. So that's a, that's a typo. Thank you. Thank you. And I apologize for some of these typos. I I actually retype these word for word um, because for some reason they're not transferring when I pull them off of MSBA to do a to do a crossover. So. I am a very good typist, but I am not perfect, so I appreciate the edits, and it is our goal. Nancy Gore has helped me today find a few more, so I appreciate everyone's help, and Mary and everyone, thank you. Thank you very much, Cindy. This is a lot of detail work, and we know you're quite diligent at it. Um, anything else on these first readings, or are we ready to move on to Policy development, second readings of policies 510, school activities, 514, bullying prohibition, and 515, protection and privacy of pupil records. Um, we are reviewing these policies. Um, something that we have instituted, which I think is helping, we're receiving the policies in advance of the board packet since they're already on the website, and it, it gives us time to take a look at them before we uh, start preparing for the Monday night meeting. So um, we, we have had ample time to look at these and if we've got anything else, this is our moment to address it. Um, I have a couple on uh, what's in our board packet is page 69, uh, section two. It's actually the top paragraph of that. Um, I'm going to give this to Cindy. I think there's a couple commas that need to go in there. But that last clause, I'm afraid I'm, I get a little confused, and I'm thinking that something needs to change. Um, the sentence that starts, the school district shall employ research-based, developmentally appropriate best practices that include preventative and remedial measures and effective discipline for deterring violations of this policy, apply throughout the district and foster student parent. Should that be applied throughout the district or apply such throughout the district? I'm a little confused about what that's supposed to say or mean. It can be an interpretation from the board and there can be additions made. This is directly from MSBA model language, so that's all I have to offer. Does that, am I, is this just me or? I, I think your professional background is is commendable because you have that same legal mind that Kathy Miller does at MSBA, but you see it slightly differently, I think, in terms of language. I'm afraid I'm looking at this grammatically, and I, I, I don't think that the sentence makes sense, and I don't know what apply is supposed to mean. Is, does anybody I else think, see what I'm talking about I here? I think there are three clauses after the, 
right. after that, that best practices that include blah, 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 apply throughout the district and foster. So it. Well, so the clauses that apply. It's the three that are previous to that. That's what applies. Okay. That's how I'm reading it, although it's a long sentence. Yeah, I think you're right, Joe. I, that, that makes sense. I just couldn't, couldn't parse through the uh, comma placement. I have the MSBA <laughs> model right here because I got it this weekend, and it, it, it's exactly verbatim. So. Okay, then we'll let that one go. Um, <laughs> and we'll just say Mary needs to read a little more closely. Um, it, it rolls right off the tongue. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure why you had that problem. I... Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, the only other uh, thing I have on here that is a little um, substantive perhaps is on section 4A. I would um, potentially propose that we delete the word target. Anyone who believes he or she may have been the target victim of bullying. I apologize for not bringing this up last time. I have just thought about it more, and I would like to delete that word target because I want somebody to report whether they are perceiving themselves to be the specific target or not. I want the victim to be able to report whether they perceive themselves as the target of the action mm -hmm. or not. I think actually there should be an or. Based on, based on the MSBA one that I just opened to, <laughs> there is or there. Or, okay. Oh, it says Where? victim or target. Target or victim. Target or victim, okay. Oh, it, that That, that would do the same thing then? I like that. So Can we put or in between target and victim on 4A? Target or Yep. Anything else? And then on the same policy that we're looking at here, which I think is, which is 514 on page 70 of that policy on the, in it's section D3, um, it, in red it has the word including coming out twice. I think the word including should still be present and on the first one and come out on the second. So it should read, is directed at any student or student's comment, including those based on a person's blah, 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 sexual orientation, comma, gender identity, and expression. You, you see what I'm saying, folks? So the red that's, the including that is struck out, you want that to remain struck out? I want the first including that is struck out to go back in. I want the second including that is struck out to stay struck out, but I think there would be a comma, sexual orientation, comma, gender identity, and expression. Agreed. We've made that change on several other policies. I do follow. Yep, these were changes that were requested by a board member last meeting, so now we're going to make that change again. Thank you. So you kept the one, you, you so you, keeping you, the first one, striking the second one, and put a comming of comma after sexual orientation. Right, keeping the first including, striking, keeping out the second including. Yeah. Thank you. Hearing none, we're going to move to our action agenda. It is recommended that the school board approve the second readings of 510 school activities, 514 bullying prohibition, and 515 protection of privacy of pupil records um, as presented and discussed with the, the grammatical changes that have been duly noted. Is there a motion for that? So moved. moved by Jim Benicke. Is there a second? Second, second by Nancy Gores. Any discussion? All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? That carries 7-0. Communications and transmittals. Anybody have anything to share? Well, there's a lot that could be shared, having done a lot regarding the um, back to school. Some of it was talked about during the meeting, some of it. Um, but we had a little tour. Some of us were lucky enough to go on a little tour of the new um, school district offices and a few of the new um, 
uh, construction projects at the schools, and I must say how impressed I was uh, with a couple of things. The, the school, the new district offices and how uh, conscientious choices were made to try to keep the costs down on what was changed and what was not. And that was impressive to me, and I just want to compliment the um, administration on those efforts. And the second uh, was uh, we saw some of the new pilot furniture that's part of that 6.8 million uh, that we're looking at. We've got pilot rooms in all the elementaries, and we've got this new furniture that's being tested. And my chair rocks. And I want to tell you, the chairs rock a little bit for our students now, too. And I think that's great to get rid of a little extra energy so you can stay focused on, on the learning. And there were some other really fun um, pilot programs and uh, furniture from desks that come up and go down, from desks that can be reconfigured in different arrangements, from smart boards that are actually like, I, ca I call it a moving billboard. You can kind of move that big smart board wherever you want it in the classroom. And I think it will allow uh, for a lot of flexibility and creativity um, by teachers who are willing to really work hard to take advantage of these new opportunities. And we were told that um, teachers that came in and students that came in and that saw this um, change that we were making um, being tested out felt more valued because of the investment that was being made in them. And, and I think that when you build morale, you build learning too. So I'm really excited about that part of our change. Well, I can segue there quite nicely because my third grader, Susan Lingren, happens, and I promise this was coincidence, to have gotten placed into a pilot classroom this year. She is absolutely in love and deems it to be the best part of third grade. No offense, of course, I'm sure is intended to her wonderful teacher or her classmates or <laughs> anything else. Um, but I was in there for Meet the Teacher and to see all of the students walk into that classroom and their eyes got really bright when they saw everything new that was in there and when they were playing with the desks moving up and down and when they were exploring the different chairs and all of the different ways they could sit in their different chairs, it really was exciting to watch and it, she's still enamored of it after a couple of weeks. So um, thank you so much to Tom and his team and to all the teachers who have weighed in so far um, into how it should look at this stage. And I'm excited to see how this moves forward over the year. All right. Well, just a reminder that the uh, homecoming football game is this Friday, uh, September 21st, for those watching and recording. Uh, the game starts at 7 o'clock, and there's a, a parade at 5.30. And I haven't been able to watch it for a couple of years. I, I know the parade goes around the school, on the streets surrounding the school. Uh, I believe you could also observe it from the stadium, right? Do they, they go around the stadium? No. No? no just pretty much around the block. Okay, just around the block, the streets that surround the, the high school. So if you want to see the parade, you'll have to get out on the street there. And, uh, before the game. Yeah. Um, I guess it was the first Friday of the school year. Aston and I in attended the, um, the AMSD, Association of Metropolitan School Districts, board meeting. And um, there was some great information um, pertaining to our upcoming elections. So there was um, a session on candidate engagement, engagement and relationship building, with um, particularly with the House candidates for um, everybody's district. And then um, Morris Leatherman came, Bill Morris of Morris Leatherman came and did a, a presentation on um, on a survey that, 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 a, that they had done for AMSD of metro households um, with a whole bunch of different questions pertaining to education. Um, so I would, that all those materials are on their website. You can see the presentation on their website. I would encourage you to look at that. And they also gave out their um, education issues guide for the election. Um, this is on, on their website as well, but I have like, they allotted us four paper copies per district, so Aston and I <laughs> grabbed our four, <laughs> and um, we decided that it was important for you guys to have access to those, so um, I'll pass these down. If you want a paper copy, please do grab one. So with that, um, I will take a motion for adjournment. Moved by Ken, is there a second? Second by Ann Casey. All those in favor say aye. aye. That carries 7-0. We are adjourned at 838. Thank you, everyone.